Okay, very good morning to everyone. Hope you're well. It's Wednesday, the 7th of August. I'm uh, just going to have a quick recap and review of all of the major news from this morning and the general sentiment uh, for markets to get things going here in London. So, first off, let's just have a, a quick look at the, the S&P 500 from yesterday. Uh, obviously, after seeing multiple days of selling pressure on the escalation of the trade war between the US and China, markets had a decent bounce. Uh, none other than Sam North calling the bottom once again, buying the dip. Uh, was a great shout, seeing the market as generally just oversold. Uh, and I, I know a lot of you in the chat were agreeing with him this time yesterday, and, and certainly a decent recovery for the moment, at least, in some of the stock markets, particularly by the close on Wall Street, the S&P rebounding around 1% after the 3% downward move that was seen. Uh, it's quite common. That's not to say that the downward trajectory of U.S. equities is, is, is over, but very rare unless there is a continuation of fundamental catalyst for a market to just go down, 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 day after day after day. Uh, I don't think I've ever really seen that happen consistently for a longer period of time other than right in the midst of the financial crisis. And we're nowhere near that type of uh, kind of red alert status, at least for the time being. So yeah, bit of a recovery. And if we just have a quick switch over to the other charts, um, the DAX positive this morning, Eurostox likewise, both trading above their respective pivot in the futures market. Uh, currencies are pretty quiet. The dollar index is essentially flat for the moment. Um, the kind of notable movers here are a little bit reflective of, I guess, the, the monetary policy environment. That's because we've had more interest rate cuts. We're going to have a look in a second at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand taking quite drastic measures overnight, seeing sharp movement in their currency. India have done the same. Uh, and this all comes amid these kind of growing risks and this, this slowing of global growth, which is becoming now the baseline kind of scenario. So the asset that's been benefiting on the back of this, of course, has been after a six year high. We now had a technical break on the previous test of the futures of the high that we had on the prior night at the reopening of um, Globex on Sunday night when we printed up at around 14, 86, 87 in gold broke above that last night, came back to test the level, and then really just pushed on. And of course, now psychological levels up and around these, uh, these record high territory, 1500 bucks now trading gold per ounce in the futures market. So very interesting to watch that as certainly maybe not so much this morning. I don't think it'd be too surprising to see 1500 act as a bit of a near term cap to price action, not until the US come in. I think when the US come in, then it's going to be decision time. Do we now break that and continue to just push on to the upside? Or does that continue to act as a, as a decent psychological barrier for the price movement? As I said, not unless something new develops in a negative sense in order to um, create another kind of push to the upside, but definitely one to watch today. And then likewise, talking about monetary policy, because if you look at the, the US 10 year, up another 11 ticks this morning, I mean, there was a day, remember last week when we came in, it was up sharply, it's up another 11 today. It's just, you know, to see the, the US Treasury market up to that degree, it's becoming quite normal fare. And, and generally speaking, that is unusual uh, to see that type of size of price movement happen overnight. Now, that's the interesting point. Um, when we look at, you know, often new inexperienced traders will ask me, how do I gauge intraday sentiment? What market is driving what? And typically that's been a North American focus, obviously Trump right at the epicenter of all things that are kind of leading market direction. However, I would say right now, the new cue for market sentiment intraday is definitely coming from Asia. And it's pretty much coming from just one single number. And that of course is this, which is the fix the Chinese Yuan uh, weakens overnight after the PBOC set its fixing closer to seven a dollar. Now, obviously this has been that, that talking point so far this week and what led to the, the stock market route on Monday uh, because they allowed the currency for the first time in what, 11 years to weaken past that psychological seven threshold, the renminbi against the dollar. Um, 
However, yesterday there was a little bit of reassurance because China acted to stabilize that with their fixing. Um, however, what happened overnight was the central bank set the daily currency reference rate marginally stronger than seven a dollar, basically at 6.9996. So ever closer to that, that level. And I think that's made people, again, a little bit apprehensive. Gold, very sensitive with those technical breaks and hence he had a decent pop overnight in the upside. And then consequently, T-notes following also with some of the central bank action. Does this put pressure on some of the Western central banks to come? Markets still very much expecting easing from the ECB. Renewed QE as well is the growing consensus. Uh, and, and is the pressure on now for, for Powell to deliver with more than just a mid-cycle adjustment is what people are, are asking. So, yeah, definitely I would say this needs to be watched. The, the way I'd interpret this is the more they set the fix above seven. So let's see here. This is the PBOC fixing in, in the black line and the Chinese RMB spot price above. And so you can see it's testing its extremity of the 2% trading band, which defines the, the Chinese currency. Um, and as such, the spot price is weakening to the extremity of what would be the, the maximum weakest point the currency can get. Now, the more that they allow that to happen, the more then that's probably going to stoke more trade um, escalation, if you like, with the US and confrontation. And so that's how I'd interpret this. As long as they continue to fix it at around seven, and if it, even if it does go above, as long as it doesn't start to shoot higher with these fixings, which I do not anticipate that it will do so, I think now that the market is used to this development, I don't think it's going to carry such firepower as such like it did on Monday. I think now this is just a new normality for, for China to, to manage this situation. Of course, their economy heavily impacted by these growing tariffs and with that additional 10% announced kicking on September 1st from Trump on that final 300 billion this for me is just rationale in order to control that domestically so yeah definitely needs to be watched going forward uh, is, is, uh, is the key takeaway the other thing that I thought was quite interesting with China was this overnight um, I'll show you the picture obviously this is a massive explosion of targeted missile testing unidentified location in North Korea now you remember how how many weeks ago was it when Trump had an historic handshake and crossed over the the, 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 the military zone divide between North and South Korea it was what eight weeks ago and now Kim Jong-un is test firing tactical guided missiles again so such is the world of politics I my view here is that North Korea there's a distinct pattern between breakdowns in the Chinese US trade dialogue and uh, military activity in North Korea whenever the trade breaks down North Korea starts to become more active again now for me this is a direct um, correlation of China and its relationship with North Korea and how Donald Trump cannot be seen now he's brokered this peace agreement and he's made such a big deal out of it what I think would be an, an interesting extra um, dimension from China's negotiation stance is to create more um, tensions in the Korean Peninsula now what I'm thinking here is then that China is the only country that can effectively manage North Korea the Americans just cannot do it it would be too disruptive in what is one of the most highly tensious areas in the East China Sea in the globe. So for me, this is China's work. This is not North Korea. And this is, this is China saying, well, as much as we might retaliate in tariffs, as much as we might stop buying your agricultural goods, as much as we might start, you know, all these different facets of, on the trade, more, more visible front, we also... Um, could jeopardize your ability to appear like you're controlling this situation and Trump's not going to want that to happen so I, I think this is ABC political gamesmanship going on here between uh, China and the US is this anything to be apprehensive about from a North Korean perspective absolutely not 
you know, I know it seems strange. North Korea test firing tactical guided missiles is business as usual, as far as markets are concerned. And I think market participants quite clearly, as I've explained, see through this as a political uh, strategy rather than it is anything that could heighten confrontation, say, North Korea, Japan, and, and so on. So markets aren't going to react to this, but it's an interesting dilemma and pressure point that China can push beyond the obvious when it comes to managing Trump having been termed a currency manipulator just two days ago. All right, other things. This was the big one overnight. Um, quite a shock to markets. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the RBNZ, cut their cash rate by half a percentage point, 50 basis points. Remember the Fed, there was a bit of a talk a few weeks ago about 50, 25, and we were, you know, we were quite firm with the belief and the Fed did deliver that 25 basis point rate cut. The overarching strategy being that you don't want to run down your ammunition of subsequent cuts thereafter if needed. Um, but New Zealand have gone you know, the full Monty because they cut their rate by more than expected. Markets were, were primed for 25. They went for 50. They lowered their economic growth forecasts. They projected it would take longer for inflation to reach the midpoint of its 1% to 3% target range. And importantly, the governor asked if today's cut no more, or does the cut mean no more to come? The governor of the RBNZ replied, no, today's decision does not rule out any future action. The RBNZ is well advanced on developing a suite of tools for unconventional policy, such as negative interest rates, asset purchases, forward guidance, and other forms of intervention. So the RBNZ have really gone to town um, overnight. Uh, interestingly, with those unconventional measures, these Antipodean central banks, the RBA, the RBNZ, did not have to deploy things like QE. Their rates were higher. They've managed to manage their economies appropriately by using the blunt instrument of just manipulating the, uh, the rate of interest. But RBNZ getting to the point of, well, you know what, we're going to have to start, it'd be prudent and necessary to start planning that we could go further. And I even think they even mentioned about taking rates negative, uh, such as what we see, in, of course, in the Eurozone with deposit rate. So this was the Kiwi overnight. If you look at the Aussie as well, done the same thing. And the Aussie is just coming up in the future space. I can see it's a quite an interesting level, so I'm sure Sam will go into that in more detail. But this kind of drastic action and commitment for more with it's almost seeming uh, I don't know I don't, want to, I don't want to use the word inevitable but there's so much pressure on the US I do think that they're going to not just ease once but further beyond that whether that happens in 2019 or 2020 I think Trump's going to have to get his way to keep the stock market up by the end of 2020 that does require more cuts and so, you know, the one trade that does look good is still that gold trade. You know, if that does, if we get a synchronized global monetary policy easing, kind of harking back to a few years ago, there's no reason why gold can't go 1600, 1750. Um, and I know there's a guy sat not far from me that would be getting wet at the whistle with me saying those kinds of numbers. Here he is. When it comes to when it comes to gold prices, uh, yeah, I mean to be fair, a stopped clock is right twice a day. Um, I have been going on about this for about eighteen months. <laughs> uh, it's finally happening, and uh, well, for now, yeah, it's just good to see it on this trend. I mean, if you look at the trend really for the last two months, it's uh, it's quite phenomenal, um, but not surprising to see when you've got easing, global easing, and uh, global tension at the same time. Cool. Thanks, Will. So, yeah, Will definitely been committed to that trade, so good to see that paying off. Um, okay, final things. Just have a quick look. WTI crude futures uh, really didn't move too much on the API data overnight. This was what happened last night. We had a drawdown in the crude figure of 3.43 million. And this does mark the, the stocks falling for an eighth week in a row. I think at the moment, though, the downward pressure on oil is not so much an infantry situation, but more this kind of latest uh, adaptation of concerns about demand, given the, the recent trade war rhetoric. 
Um, and the headline figure not too far removed from market consensus. Um, the drawdown of 3.43 was against expectations of 2.8. Cushing a draw of 1.6 million. Gasoline pretty much in line. A draw of 1.1 million. Distillates a build of 1.2 million. So no real movement overnight or too much in WTI crude. And then as far as Brexit goes, I can see the pound seeing a little bit of movement. So let me just quickly check on my charts if there's anything. I'm sure Sam can fill you in if there was anything fundamental. I can't see anything on the feeds. Uh, looks like just a technical break above its pivot level, which was restricting some of the price action late in the Asia Pacific session more than anything. But I just wanted a quick word. Brexit, not a great deal going on at the moment. Uh, to be honest, I don't think there's a, a particularly large degree of any headline risk when it comes to trading the pound right now. But that will come in due course, of course, in the coming weeks. Um, the headlines, opponents of no deal Brexit hardening their plans to block Johnson's threat. For the moment, obviously, uh, the official line, as much as you might not believe it, is that Boris Johnson is saying he's not going to call a general election. Um, but Corbyn has signalled early no confidence vote in the House of Commons. Some belief that that could happen as soon as early September. This, of course, could be quite interesting given the majority of Boris is at, is at one, given that Welsh by-election we had last week. Um, the, the government then has 14 days to try and see if it can sort something out. If that doesn't happen, then that can lead to the, the, the snap election scenario. Uh, and then Dominic Grieve, as well as a lot of the Remainers, um, from the Conservative Party that were given the chop when the cabinet reshuffle happened when Boris came in have all said that they could potentially form their own slight alliance. So, yeah, interesting times to come right now. I wouldn't say any of this is particularly new. And as far as I would say trading the pound, uh, I would be looking more on the technical setup and movement of the dollar on the back of the trade stuff rather than anything shocking to, to come out of Brexit uh, so much today. All right, from a Canada perspective, you can see here IN, India. India also did cut rates. Uh, that happened overnight. Their repo rate now 5.4%. Um, expectations were for 5.5, which would have been technically a 25 basis point rate cut, but they actually executed a 35 basis point rate cut. Quite unusual, comparative to the Western model, but yet yeah, a deeper rate cut than expected once again from another major global central bank. Um, going further forward, the morning very quiet, in fact. Uh, and so, again, I, not too much in the media aftermath for, for fundamental catalysts, I'd say, to really trade this morning. Very much so, very interested to watch that gold market at around this, this 1500 level. And then really for the US to come in when comics gets underway and the volume picks up in the gold market, that definitely will be one to watch. You've got the oil inventories later, of course. And then potentially just any further response out of uh, US President Donald Trump after what's been the weakest fixing level that we've seen uh, out of this recent development from the Chinese Central Bank with the PBOC fixing uh, basically bang on seven uh, overnight. So I'm sure Trump will have something to say about that. But interestingly, Trump himself has been you know, relatively passive. He knows now that he does need to control this to a certain degree kind of expecting that to continue for the moment. Okay, let me hand you over to Sam. He can look over the charts uh, and I will catch you guys later on. Thanks very much. Hi guys, good morning. Uh, let's have a, a quick look over. Uh, we'll start with the Kiwi today uh, and then bring in the Aussie. After last night's or overnight's decision, you can see a big push to, to the downside. And, and what's interesting here, and I, I tweeted this yesterday, just seeing what, what people were, were potentially thinking about the Kiwi. And I'm just going to put this onto uh, a weekly chart. So here, the first point of this trend line, going back to 2015, and, and you can see that broke overnight. Uh, so obviously the, the fundamental reason behind it, but also the, technically that bottom part of that, that trend really really breaking to the downside. And we were for, well, it seems like four years getting squeezed either way. Uh, and a, a decent push lower, obviously now, uh, or certainly on the futures, uh, the lowest we've been since 
January 2016. So it'd be interesting to see what happens here for, for the Kiwi. If you are trading it or still have some part of a position on here, obviously the, the next really key point uh, market related level is uh, is still a fair way uh, down that 19th or the week of the 19th of January 2016 before we do get that 2015 low. Uh, so price is breaking out there and uh, that follow through to, to the Aussie as you would expect uh, weakening that as well and that again for the Aussie is now the the, the weakest we've actually been for let me just bring this into picture to left hand side since 2009 for the Aussie uh, against the dollar there so massive move we uh, beginning of the year obviously made that low came back not too long ago to find support uh, around December time was it December time yeah December pushed higher and uh, yeah you can see since then it's uh, just been drifting down and so quite low for, for the Aussie more intraday I guess for both the Kiwi and the Aussie, if you can get any type of retracement, it would be you know good to to get short. Again, we're keeping an eye on the uh, the previous lows of this week for for the Aussie at any point if you could get up there for for a short. As we just testing the the S two again was a previous low, so not the worst place in the world for uh, a short uh, as well. Perhaps as Ant mentioned not long ago, the pound just pushing above that pivot. You can see certainly since we made that uh, yearly low, we've got uh, the market just drifting higher. Uh, while we've had a couple of goes at trying to break this trend, you can see there on the fifth, uh, the beginning of the week, a little false break, and but you can see see relatively well respected um, opportunity may come on, on a break of that to the downside. Certainly the resistance points uh, slightly more choppy, uh, but you can almost say 120. 213 and we've had a, a fair bit of uh, resistance at that point so price getting squeezed either way i think at the moment you would probably favor it to the downside as a better opportunity but each time we've, we've come to that area uh, we failed to really go so uh, treat with caution it might be that you want a, a further headline uh, or more negative sentiment to drift back into the market or even a bit of dollar strength uh, before taking this trade on uh, euro uh, we we had uh, obviously a big push overnight yesterday and then drifted lower. The pivot acted as a, a good level support and that pivot level was also uh, just below there with the, the highs that we had back on the 31st. So understandably found support, drifted on and we're now into this new range if you like, 112.53 and then of course that uh, lower point that we had yesterday just above 112. So that would be somewhere I'd be focusing on. Just below where we're trading now was also the initial low of the morning, then the evening. So at 112.25, uh, I think you've got your, your three key levels and points of interest uh, there. So I'm going to quick look, see if we can get any kind of trend lines from those lows. It doesn't necessarily look all too good. So yeah, I'll keep it to, to those levels, to the high of the day, to yesterday evening's low, and then the low of yesterday and that 112 handle uh, will remain to be pretty key. Uh, as well s p let's get it on that daily chart because that 200 day moving average is back and back with a bang and you can see you know i'm just gonna remove the pivots here put that 200 on and you can see just how good yet again that was the failure to close below uh, the 200 day moving average and we're, we're back above uh, key levels to the upside and, and this is looking on that daily chart is really anywhere around here 2880 not just because uh, you know it's all over Twitter as well so people are looking at it but just from a price action point you can see just how important that whole area was back in June and into July uh, you want a line in the sand that's it there so where, whether we can close uh, above or below today will be key um, I, I think that's you know as as big a level as we've seen uh, in recent times for the S&P around here so really keeping an eye first retested that yesterday where you can see a strong one to the downside and uh, we did actually bounce uh, testing my maps here 26 points off that so really key level keeping a, a close eye on that if that wasn't to hold then sure we can start to drift down and you know I know people will be looking around 2730 uh, as well so almost uh, a case of this has to hold this week or we could drift low if we get back above I think you get a faster move to 29 uh, 11 at the corner of my eye, I've just seen safe alley wearing the MAGA hat uh, which is a first believe me um, let's, have it. let's get this on camera actually to see it suits you down a bit yeah where's Here the S&P 
S&P trading don't, just under 28.80. Don't let them win, Sam. Don't let them win. Don't let them win. We've got a, a long-time bear in the office here who will tell you it's going lower. Um, looking elsewhere, gold, of course, up to those highs, and it just doesn't want to stop. It just does not want to stop. 1,500 trading. Uh, I was just looking at a chart this morning from when Gordon Brown sold uh, gold at uh, 288, which just seems incredible now. Uh, but this market going higher and and for, for the time being you don't necessarily want to get in the way of it yes there'll be opportunities intraday to get short but this uh, very much uh, a case of looking to follow the trend speaking of trends from the low of the first you can see just how well we respected that all yesterday uh, if you want to stay long and you know as long as it's above this trend it's not a bad option to perhaps to, to go with uh, we are knocking on the door around the, the high one, two, three times on the hour. So that's something to perhaps keep a close watch on uh, as well. Oil, to, to wrap things up, we have a quick look at the DAX. Um, and an, another draw, but oil still drifting lower. Small range this morning, got a fair bit of uh, support uh, that we just can't break through there. Just going to put this onto uh, a 240 chart and just zoom to the left hand side and look at levels below where we're trading. Um, let me just get this trend line on from that low of June. Drag that to here. That's something that I would have on just because that third test could well come in around 53, a break of that. Uh, and obviously we could start pushing to the downside. Also, quite an interesting uh, trend here that starts on the low of the second. Where was the low of today? Well, you get that, that third test there. So quite a big area. Um, you do have some previous lows in the mix, but these trend lines certainly worth having marked up on the chart. To the upside, if we were to, to drift, you can see those highs from today just getting squeezed in. So again, worth having a trend line on there. But the pivot certainly looks pretty important. $54, the pivot, the low of yesterday. So as your technical levels of interest just below where we're trading and around the pivot uh, will be ones to keep an eye on. The DAX on the open. Relatively quiet, but pushing uh, above the pivot not too long ago, trying to sustain that, got some resistance. And again, this would be more of a zone for me rather than a, an individual level uh, that I would have marked up there. Can we get back above there and, and stocks 2880 in the US for the S&P? May well be the focus. If that was to hold and we drift back lower and almost below the pivot, those lows from today and yesterday evening could, of course, come into play. As usual, any questions, please uh, do let us know. Uh, stocks at uh, a key turning point. The pound's still getting squeezed. Is the euro going to start drifting lower? That 112 handle, certainly one to, to focus on. Kiwi and Aussie not looking good. Uh, and oil, of course, with that data out later uh, remains important. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Please let us know. And I hope you have a, a great trading day.